Can we start like with the important yeah. stuff? Yeah, we're starting. We're gonna where this is is Daily Monday with Professor Rambo and Paul Gordon. I am Paul Gordon, and you are the professor. You jump the professor. This show is so messed up. I'm talking while I'm eating. Yeah, I'm doing that. I don't even care anymore. Mm. I'm eating, by the way. Delicious Frito scoops. Sponsor of the show, not a sponsor. <laughs> so, and I'm drinking, I'm drinking Deer Park water. By the way, also Deer not a sponsor of our show. Uh, a sponsor of our show, not a real sponsor. Uh, but a sponsor of our show, not a real sponsor. You know, Deer Park has always creeped me out. You know why? You work because you think of deer poop. Yeah, I'm thinking deer poop water. Your take right. <laughs> Deer Park water. So it's water out of a park for deer. What do deer do in the water? They kind of poop. They so this do is lots deer of poop. Pooping. Everybody poops. But do I have to be that upfront and personal with the do awareness? I to, do of I have the to yawn again? You do can I? yawn all you want. I'll tell you what, I'll lay back and relax since you know how to run the show. And you run the show. Go ahead. Come on, you got this, Bob. All right, let's, let's let's do this right for a change. You know what we're gonna oh, go ahead. <laughs> I came up with an idea. I was, I well, first of all, I have to say my new favorite thing of all times is trolling people on Facebook. <coughs> it's like a sport. It is. It is. You, you take people with little or no knowledge about a subject who then start commenting on it like they know what the hell they're talking about and i just can't help myself it's, i have to set them straight and, and i try to do it in the least sarcastic abusive well that's a lie i am horribly sarcastic <laughs> and abusive but but i have toned down the profanity i have even though i enjoy it immensely so yeah um, so somebody was making a stupid comment, a political comment, and I said to them that you are a media zombie, and whatever the media tells you to do, you go marching. Hey, my, uh, oh, this is the most important subject matter of all times. Uh, this three week's... months ago, it was something different. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I'm going to march on whatever because I'm an idiot. Everything so, relies on this week's fear porn. Yeah, and, and it's funny because he was using every talking point that the media has been like pushing hard for the last six months, and half of the stuff wasn't even true and, and is shown to be false, and yet he was still going with it. It was part of his narrative, at which point it occurred to me, he's a zombie. He's gotten it in his head that he needs to go eat brains. Someone has convinced them that it's time to eat brains. This is the reason why. So go start eating brains. And here he is. And a few months, a week, a couple of days later, there'll be the next thing. Oh, my God, these racist statues all over the country. And then three weeks before that, oh, my God, these racist people. Oh, my God, this Klan march. Oh, my God, these cops are killing people. Oh, my God, people are killing cops. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And it's just one thing after another after another that people are inundated with. And they fall. Yeah. For it. And well, they this segment, you see, you're not professional. This segment is our eye prepper segment. We're doing things out of order today. We're doing eye prepper now. We're doing eye world next. And then we're going to do full auto in the eye prepper segment. What what? what professor rambo just set up is are you a media zombie and how can you avoid being well first off what is a media zombie how can you identify if you are a media zombie and how do you avoid being a media zombie and why should you because and maybe being a media zombie is not a bad thing well, being aware is a very good thing. Why? 
because if you're a prepper or have inclinations on being self-reliant and self-prepared, you need to know what's going on in the world. Yes. That said, and you need to treat it with logic and reason and suspicion. And if you find yourself, which I have, so I'm guilty of this, becoming e emotional about the subject, now you got a problem. You have every right to be angry at the facts. You have every right to be emotional and upset at what's going on. But is it part of a bigger push amongst certain groups and individuals to keep you emotional and keep you off balance and looking at the wrong issues? So as a prepper, let's say you're a hardcore prepper and you're really upset about potential civil disturbance. Well, I hate to tell you, you're far more likely to encounter a bad storm than you are civil disturbance in your neighborhood. And if you're in a, in a neighborhood that suffers from a lot of civil disturbance, well, maybe it's time to move. Yeah, if you can. If you can, yeah, then... Yeah, of course. Uh, you, you got issues. I feel bad look, for you, but... But you have to look at the subjects in as cold and objective a manner as possible so that you can cut through the BS and say... Do I really need 47 AK-47s? Maybe whoa. I just need four. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't go down that road. Well, you didn't let me finish. Maybe okay. I just need four AK-47s and 43 ARs or a variety of different kinds of guns. Do you really maybe need maybe 47 AKs and 47 ARs. Boom. Problem. Problem solved. Diversity. They, it's, it's that simple. The reality is everyone has a limitation on resources. Most people do. Are you spending those, are you spending your resources and allocating your resources based on emotions that are governed by what you see in the media? Or are you looking at statistics? Are you, I mean, you could do a simple statistical study on Google on the likelihood of tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and such in your area versus civil disobedience and civil disturbances. Spend your resources wisely and not from an emotional perspective where you have become a media zombie being led down this road and that road, and every few months there's a new tragedy, a new disturbance, a new issue. I mean, it, what was the last big thing, Paul? Oh, the last really, really shrill big thing was yeah, probably sure. the, the, the Trump uh, uh, comment on, you know, the, 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 the S-holes. I mean, there yes. have been minor little things since then, okay. but this one was and the last that, like, ah, we're all going to die. Throw in Cecil the Lion way back. and uh, So what was the one before that? <laughs> the one before that, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You, you can't even remember them all. They don't, I mean, they're like, while you're in the vortex, you feel like this is it. This, everything is centered around this thing. Three weeks later, you don't even remember it. That's Whether right. it was you know, the Me Too hashtag thing, that, that, there, that, that's thrown in there somewhere. Suddenly, all these, you know, it's interesting. You had this series in rapid succession of people coming out accusing other people of sexual assault. Now, all of a sudden, you're not seeing it happening every day. It's like a trickle. But, like, it, 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 it's almost like it was an orchestrated thing. But I know nobody would do that. No. So I wanted, I had some thoughts. And before the Me Too thing, what was that? I don't know. I don't want to go through the list of, unless you've got a point to make that I'm missing. Well, the point is, we can barely remember what all this shit was. And I doubt, no. I doubt people with average memories, like me and you, don't remember. Now, ask my wife. She'll, she'll go through it 
line by line, by item by item, and tell you what month, what year, what day, what if minute. If she can she do were... it, then I can do it. I will crush her. We well, will have go ahead. a, a go ahead. fear porn memory contest. So who remembers more fear porn? And it's not just fear porn. I mean, it's you know. Uh, well, my definition, it is all fear porn. But I have a broad definition of what I'm describing as fear porn. The big ones that stick out for me was the the shooting in Las Vegas, the statues being ripped down, uh, Charlottesville, the you know the right the, the guy the who run over getting that hit, program. correct, uh, the march in Boston, uh, and it's just it's endless, and you can go through the news cycle for years and look at all of this stupid crap one after the other it's almost like the newspapers are creating the news to keep you emotional and off balance and not looking at the real issues here's something that i notice and i noticed this a while ago uh i i as i've said on numerous occasions like it's my business to track the news like i'm looking at news in multiple sources i mean multiple sources, worldwide sources. And I'm pay paying particular attention to America local news sources. And I noticed this too. When, when I started doing this about three years ago, when I was really starting to track American local news as an aggregate, I began to notice that the narratives that were emerging were almost simultaneous across the board throughout these local news outlets, whether it was Fayetteville or, or, or Tallahassee or Anchorage, Alaska, whatever the outrage of the moment was, the narratives were all similar and they all happened almost at the same time. There's a number of reasons behind that. I don't want to get into that necessarily, but well, it's not necessarily some dark conspiracy. No, but it's, a big part of it is that news agencies have had to trim down their staffs, so they rely on bigger news agencies like AP for their news oh, content. A a AP, UPI, all all the major uh, world and national news sources that everyone uses. So, so if if the AP reports, hey. The information is going to come out drip, drip, drip. Do you remember that that line that they used? The drip, drip, drip of information that comes out. I remember hearing that over and over on different news sources. And even I think one of the radio hosts carried it and repeated it and said, look at all these different sources. Why are they reporting the same thing in the exact same way over and over again? It's because it's, they're getting them from the same sources. And correct. And, and the other thing to add to that is overwhelmingly the news media is being run by people who have a very similar mindset. They don't have to get into... I always like to bring up the, the Hitler method of management. And now, he didn't come up with this method, but I like to use Hitler because it's, you know, got to use the Hitler example to really really be jolting. So the Hitler Mettler of he method of management was not to micromanage the people around him. He wanted some degree of culpability as well, especially in certain, you know, like the Jewish problem. So what he did was he selected people that he knew deep down wanted to do what he wanted them to do. So in the news media, there's this Maybe to some degree it's intentional, to some degree it's kind of self-perpetuating. They tend to pick people in key positions of, of, of filtering, if you will, that want to do what they want them to do. They want the progressive statist agenda advanced on a daily basis. And they don't have to get together and say, all right, everybody, this is what we're doing. No, no, no. They got a whole bunch of filters that have gone through all the schools of journalism that have put them in the positions to be selected by the news outlets 
to be the filters, the gatekeepers, so that there, there's there's no issue. There's no problem whatsoever for the news media to seem like it's acting as one, but it's not. It's just that it gets its sources from the same place, and it's run by people with remarkably similar mindset so that's why everything sounds so similar now to a certain degree and agendas well yeah and to a certain degree there is some some cabals that happen definitely and by the way that happens on the conservative side as well these cabals uh uh these groups get together these these news people get together to to work on their narratives conservatives and progressives alike but uh the point of this segment is to ask yourself, okay, you don't want to be a, a media zombie. So ask yourself the outrage that you're fully embroiled in, that you're putting so much time, effort, and energy into. Ask yourself the degree to which you actually control the outcome. And if your answer is not at all, then you should significantly reduce the amount of time that you're putting into it. I'm not saying you don't pay any attention, but you should be significantly reducing the amount of time. It's, okay, you're looking at a situation, you're like, okay, here's a potential outcome and here's a potential outcome. What does that tell me about how I should prepare my life? If there's something I can do to change the outcome, well, then I'm going to be more engaged. If there's something I can't do to change the account, the, the outcome, then I'm just working on preparing for whatever contingencies I possibly can. Almost all of the outrages that we're talking about, you can't control. And, and almost all of these outrages, and, they're and battles we'll have, over identity. And, and will have no effect on your real life. No, n Well, they... They can have a real effect on your real life, but only insofar as you actually let the emotion of fighting for your identity. You know, like with the Me Too movement, you have the, you know, rape is everywhere narrative making men and women who don't like feminists feeling fundamentally threatened. And so they get emotionally involved in fighting back. And then... You know, the Me Too people, most of them, they're, they're probably, they're not wicked people trying to destroy your lives. They earnestly believe that they're representing justice and they feel like they're not being listened to. Their, their identity as a victim is being challenged. And so there's this battle of identity that's going on and it embroils all these people in this, in this, really this fight for their own identity that you, know, you won't cancel out my identity. Meanwhile, all around them, there's all types of opportunities that are passing them by to actually make decisions about their lives that put them in a better position to actually identify and, and defend against real threats around them. That makes sense. Yeah, and use your money wisely and find ways to make more money so you can prepare better. Because more oh, yeah, money, more money, more better. More to better. a certain degree. I, I actually I won't say. Actually, more guns and more better is always more guns. So, more money is not always the right answer. Yeah, but more money gets you more guns. Oh, gets that, you more, never mind. <laughs> never mind. More money, <laughs> more money. Money. The pursuit of money. Uh, I mean, you. I, I wrote a novel once. And uh, in the novel, there's this, I made up this story about this homeless guy, and and he he has in it he's held he's held on to this lottery ticket that he won. Uh, he never cashed in. He would have won millions and millions of dollars, but he never cashed it in. The reason he didn't cash it in is because until he won that lottery ticket, he had become so obsessed with the numbers in his bank account that his whole life was about putting up the numbers for his bank account, making that bank account bigger and bigger and bigger. Meanwhile, he had left basically the rest of his life go to hell. I mean, he was a dedicated hard worker and made tons of money, but uh, at the end of the day, he was just, he was, he was participating in a fruitless sport of watching numbers go up. So yeah, 
the pursuit of money can become a consumption in and of itself that leads you leads you you're going to end up not actually fulfilling your core preferences but i'll say generally making money is a good thing and you should embrace it and not be afraid to try and go out and do that rather than battling people over their identities or defending your identity. I've had That's conversations recently with socialists in other countries who, you know, point out the evils of capitalism and how much better their societies are for, um, for not partaking as much in capitalism as other countries have. And I always ask him this question, how are the poor people in your country faring? And they're like, well, you know, there's malnutrition and there's this and that. And how often do they get to the hospital? Well, not really. A lot of them just die young. Like, okay. So in the United States, the pursuit of money allows and the wealth allows poor people to just walk into a hospital and get treatment for a broken leg or whatever else ails them. And oh, there's really no such thing as malnutrition in America because you can go anywhere and get food. And even if you don't have money, you can get food. So money and wealth buys you stuff. It, it's a facilitator. The more you make, the more guns you can get. Or you could choose not to get. The more ammo you can get, or choose not to get. The more food you can squirrel away, or not to squirrel away. But it gives you that option. You can do what you want with that resource. When you don't have money, your choices just went to zero. So right. you can you can live the, your principles, you can live whatever you want, but in the end, you don't have choices when you don't have money. Yeah, I'm not anti-money. I'm just not I don't think it's healthy to be totally consumed by the pursuit of money. If all you're doing is pursuing money and you're not actually having time to uh, to well, that's true yeah, with yeah. everything. Pay, pay. If you're pursuing, if all you do is pursue daffodils, growing daffodils in your yard, and you're obsessed with daffodils and nothing else, well, guess what? You're wasting a lot of your life on stupid shit like daffodils. There's yeah. other things to do with your life. Yes. Like not being sucked into the latest fear porn vortex. So, and like uh, making money. <laughs> well, yeah, it's better to pursue making money than to be sucked into the the latest fear porn uh, vortex. So yes. we're gonna we're gonna transition without any transitions or bumps or anything because Let's do it. You know, Let's see if it hurts. Up. Do you think we're it'll hurt? To, it's not gonna hurt. Oh, good. We're gonna okay. we're gonna talk about something that I think you'd really want to talk about. I'm getting tired of this subject. Really? <laughs> yeah, I am actually. Can you believe it? You're getting tired of talking about Turkey? Okay, you guys don't know. He calls me. Uh, well, whether I call him in the morning or he calls him to me in the morning, however it happens, inevitably, I know at some point we're going to talk about Turkey. Well, it's just I so delicious. It. The gravy, the cranberries. No, the country. The country turkey. The country is a serious problem, and I don't think people realize how serious a problem it is. It's a sociopathic, schizophrenic culture that is bound, now that it's seen some success, to try and assert itself. And it it's is. It's an imperialistic swine, is what it well, is. Well, it, you know, it takes I'm not the being worst. Hyperbolic. Well, I know, but it takes the worst of Rome and the worst of Byzantium and the worst of Islam and the worst of the Asiatic steppe peoples like the Huns and and other murderous cultures um, and combines them into a culture today that the people living in Asia Minor are very proud to call themselves something they're not, Turks. So they're not genetically turkish or oh turkish. you're going to go down that road yeah I'm, they are i don't want to go down that road right now but i, I, I want to 
I want to. Okay, go ahead. So they're anything but Turkic. They're the native peoples of that land. The powers that govern over that country know this. And to keep this hidden from the population, the general populations, they start problems regularly to redirect their people. Sound familiar? Uh, with fear porn and the creation of news zombies, because back then it was just newspapers uh, back in the day, and uh, word of mouth and radio later on. And it's the same exact thing that's happening everywhere. Uh, their populations are being misled and they're getting involved in another conflagration. They're invading uh, a group of people that essentially have done nothing to them and they're blaming them for all their problems and their security lapses. They're not blaming themselves, they're blaming someone else. Well, now, now they've swerved into my area and now they're really ticking me off <clears throat> because yeah. they're going after, if you go to iState.tv, do a search for Rahava, you're going to find a lot of stories on iState.tv on Rahava. That's not a, that's, that's, that's not an accident. I, I am watching Rahava and for, for anyone who I'm going to, I'm going to word this very delicately. Anyone who favors, uh, tilting the balance of power towards individuals and free associations over coercive enterprises, anybody who imagines that there is an alternative, alternative forms of human governance that don't involve, uh, direct coercion, you want to pay attention to Rahava. They're doing, I mean, they're not. They're not perfect over there. They're not doing, I don't agree with everything that they do, but it's a pretty grand experiment. Two million plus people are in, in are, 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 are doing an experiment in confederal democracy. And, uh, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's a deviation from the coercive enterprise model. And w there's an enclave that's, separate from the main Rahavan body, but it's still part of the Rahavan body. Uh, it's an enclave called Afrin. And the Turks are in the process of invading or trying to invade Afrin. They're, and these are Rahavans that are fighting against the Turks. Now, what's interesting is on the other side, fighting with the Turks. I mean, it's <laughs> Syria is such a convoluted mess of, of, of allies that are allies one day and enemies the next. So Turkey is fighting with Syrian rebels that are in opposition to Assad. So Russia is, I would say, allowing Turkey to go forward with this invasion an invasion that in a lot of ways is undermining Assad, Russia's ally. <laughs> so, Well, the, the, the reason why some suspect that uh, the Russians are allowing the Turks to take this land away from the Kurds is that they're going to then leave and allow Assad's troops to go in and take it over because Assad's troops have not been able to go after the Kurds. They won't. Uh, but the Kurds have taken a lot of territory. So if the Turks pull out, then the vacuum will be filled by Assad's people. And this would make the Russians very happy. That's you, the you theory. Un you understand, though, that the Kurds are good customers of Assad, that they pay, that yeah, and not, they not send Assad that. money. Yeah, but uh, generally speaking, territory that Turkey takes they don't easily give back. I mean, yeah, they they I, caused the they caused the disturbances in Cyprus in the '60s. They sent agents in, into Cyprus. It's well documented at this point to blow up mosques and post offices and kill Turks and blame the Christians for it, which they did, and then they used that to create further 
disturbance because after the Turks start attacking the Greeks and then the Greeks retaliate and the Turks naturally the Turkish Cypriots think that it's the Greeks who are attacking them they start attacking the Greeks and then they call in the Turks for support and help when the Turks show up they purge a third of the island of its Greek inhabitants and take it over well does that sound familiar who's who started pumping men and munitions into into Syria? It was the Turks. They all went well, through Turkey. The, the they, Americans, they are culpable. The Americans well, had their fair share of uh, funding what would come to be known as ISIS, as as did Turkey in spades. As did Israel, as did as, Saudi right. Arabia. Okay, there were lots of players involved in that. But Turkey was huge. And it was Turkish police that found chemical weapons in, in a Turkish apartment building and brought it to everyone's attention, at which point Russia called a meeting with NATO and said, I thought we had treaties where we're not allowing uh, each other's countries and satellites to have chemical weapons in them, which caused a huge problem for Turkey within NATO. And everybody shut it down and said to Russia, handle it how you like. So. The Turks have been very, very involved in causing these disturbances in Syria. Uh, and I would speculate that they were involved in gassing Syrian people and saying, look, it's Assad who's gassing Sy the Syrian people, when in fact it was agents of Turkey who were doing it and blaming Assad. And that's why that didn't go anywhere with the UN, because people were, were wise to them by that point. Now that they've created this mess, Oh, now they're going to go and invade to secure their security, to secure their security against these Kurds who are dangerous and aligned with terrorists all over the world. Dude, you caused right. the problem. All you got to do is cry the terrorist word. That's boy, that's something that many nations do. So just but some even more. The Turks created the Kurdish problem within Turkey. And now they're using the Kurdish problem that they created within Turkey as justification along parallel with the Kurdish problem they created in Syria to attack these Rehavans. What See, my, the hell? my interest, I don't really care about Turkey. I don't care about Turkey's history. I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but I don't. I, but I'm, I'm really of care how about. This country operates. I'm. Right. I, I care about what's happening right now on the ground in, uh, you know, the, the, the city of Afrin, which is under siege. Now, the reports coming out are, as you can imagine, they're a little conflicting. So the Turks have claimed that they've captured five villages. Meanwhile, uh, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights uh, they actually claim that two of the villages have already been taken back. And the YPG itself has said, no, the Turks haven't entered the enclave at all. And we have repelled the initial Turkish invasion and we're now shelling them with rockets. An interesting wrinkle to this, I think. I didn't see this coming. Maybe if I had known more, maybe I would have seen it is Iran's call on Turkey to stop its aggression against the Kurds and Iran has making over, is making overtures to the Kurds that they want to have a good partnership with them that again this whole dynamic that's going on you know this meanwhile you have the Sochi talks coming up Iran's going to be there Turkey's going to be there. Russia's going to be there. Apparently, Iraq has just been invited to be there. And meanwhile, it's also been suggested that there will be no Kurds there. So, you know, what's up with that? You know, Erdogan Dude. has a meeting with the Russians. And after the meeting with the Russians, he seems more defiant than he was before. I would say something happened at that Russian meeting that gave him a reason to feel like he could be so defiant. The Russians, Dude. you know. The cards have been played. Here, here's another. Here's another wrinkle. Ready? The Russians believe that the Turks will get bogged down and be shown their asses, 
And that's why the Russians are saying, yeah, 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 go ahead. And they want to see Turkey get their hat handed to them. And then Turkey knows it's reality and then starts to act like a good little obedient satellite afterwards. That's one theory. That's Paul theory. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that could be. That could be what's going on. Why Russia would be backing off and say, yeah, Turkey, go ahead. Get yourself messed in that. Go ahead. Have fun. So, look. The cards have been played. The Kurds are a player on the world stage right now. This is exactly what happened to the Turks during the Ottoman Empire. You had a bunch of ragtag, barefoot peasants who were sick and tired of being treated like second class citizens who said, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. Oh, you're a Turk? Yeah, you're our mortal enemy and we will defeat you. And these nobodies became somebodies in, this, in these wars against the Ottoman Empire that dismantled the Ottoman Empire. This is Erdogan's nightmare. He is reliving the Ottoman Empire. He is the Sultan, the new Sultan. He's, he was going to recreate the new Ottoman Empire. And all of a sudden, he has a group within Turkey that doesn't want to be inside of Turkey anymore. They want their independence. And this is chafing his ass so bad, he is going to make huge... He's already made huge mistakes. His foreign policy is a nightmare. Every country at his border is it considers turkey an enemy a threat not one sees turkey as a viable ally they perceive them rightfully so as a danger and i think so, the russians see them right now as a useful idiot correct and so as this all unfolds the kurds 20 million of them are not going anywhere. And as they keep killing Kurds in Rojava and other parts of that area, it's only going to metastasize the cancer They're, within they, Turkey. I don't I don't know. They may potentially take Afrin. I mean it's it's kind of isolated. The Rojavans can't fully get uh assistance to it. And even I mean when by the way, when you're talking about the Kurds, you're they're not all one. There's like Correct. different factions. So there's this one faction, for instance, the the PUK called the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, and uh, they're they're the ones that are the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga have a a well deserved reputation for being hard as nails fighters, and they have recently uh, made overtures to Rahava and said, "Hey, man, we're with you." And where you know they call it a spiritual spiritual battle that the Rahavans are fighting, but they're like, well, we don't know if we can get our Peshmerga there. If we can, we'll figure out a way. But it doesn't sound like they're going to be sending the the Peshmerga anytime soon. And I'd be willing to bet that part of that reason is because the Patriotic Patriotic Union of Kurdistan and the Rahavans, they're Kurds, but they're very different. Because the Rahavans, they've adopted this Murray Bookchin form of statelessness, if you will. Not perfectly, but this is what they're pursuing. It's very radically different from the kind of culture that the Peshmerga uh, are, are part of. So there's a real clash there. Now, normally, I, I'm not necessarily taking sides between two coercive enterprises battling over who gets to enslave what group of people. But this is one of those battles for me that actually I can pretty clearly pick a side for very personal well, reasons. I, I let's, let's look at what's on the map. And what's on the map is Turkey has F-16s, main battle tanks, and all the gear and equipment that NATO's been throwing at them for the last 50 years. You mean like the U.S. has in Iraq and right. Afghanistan? Okay. Well, no. No, the, the Turks have been... No? The Turks have been actually uh, training with NATO troops. So their, their capabilities are superior to Iraq and Afghanistan, the, those who are no, fighting... That, no, 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 no. I'm talking about 
the U.S. forces and what uh, they're okay. doing in yes. Iraq and but Afghanistan. The chance, dude, the chance of them getting bogged down is very, very good. But at the moment they they find themselves getting bogged down, they're going to hightail it out of there. The chances of them taking the cities and towns and villages that they want to take are pretty high. They're going to take them. They have air support, air superiority. They have modern artillery. They have modern ta tanks. They're going to go in. They're going to take what they're going to take. They're going to do what they want to do. They're going to say, yay, we succeeded. Look, we're great and wonderful, and the Ottoman Empire lives. And, and then, then they're going to say, the oh, insurgency. shit. Yeah, and they're going to be like, oh, shit, we got to get out of here. And then we're going to say, yeah, victory. Now we're leaving. Yes, and they're going to leave. Yeah. And it's going to be a huge PR campaign uh, success story for Erdogan that he's the new sultan. And he's going to say, well, we did what we, well, our objectives were met and there was no reason to stay there. If there's no yeah, resistance, I, that, they're not that, leaving. I, I, I think that's a, that, that's a fair chance that uh, that is what's going to occur. I'll say the longer this is prolonged, the greater the chance that the U.S., Saudi Arabia, Israel will begin pumping more more stuff into Afrin to help them fight back against the, the Turks. But I think they're going to be waiting to see, well, how what is the resolve of of Afrin? And if they fall fast, then you know they're not going to you know send in aid. But the United States, they're already walking back from their commitment to the Kurds. This is what the United States does over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. And these, these people, uh, th these folks in many ways were like the backbone of, of the U.S. effort to, to actually fight ISIS. Once the U.S. actually decided to actually fight ISIS, which didn't happen until Trump. Uh, and these folks have been given their blood, sweat, and tears. And the United States... As Afrin is being invaded, you have Mattis saying, well, the Turks do have some security concerns, some legitimate security concerns. That's what Mattis said just recently. So that's the United States of America for you. You don't listen, world. If the United States of America is is your ally that you you need to be your true and faithful ally, you're doing it wrong. Because the United States of America has proven again and again and again it's not loyal to anyone but Israel. Israel is it. Israel's the only nation that I don't think the United States, well, under Obama, it somewhat buckled, but he was an anomaly. But uh, number that, two would be Great Britain. Yeah, I, I, it has been. I'm just not sure yeah. going forward that that's going to be the case. Oh, by the way, big news. I'm going to cover this tomorrow, probably, well, on iState. Uh, there's probably going to be the either top, top story or darn near uh, the top. Uh, did you, did you, this is kind of diverting from this topic, but I just want to mention this, folks. Uh, Donald Trump has just announced that he is going to be enacting a 30% tariff on solar products. And some, I don't know the exact tariff details, but apparently on washing machines and other things. So he has started a tariff war. So good times. I'm sure that's not going to trigger any kind of response from the other nation states that are being targeted with this tariff war. Good, good plan. Good times. Just, just thought I'd throw that out because I think we're done with this and we're going to go to our, I got a little bit of time left. Look, just real quick. The Turks are going to do one of two things. They're either going to take the territory and try to stay there as long as possible and annex the territory in time. If they hit some serious resistance and it's not going well, they're going to pull back and say, hey, what a, what a victory this was. We'll see how that goes because the Kurds now have and potentially have the backing of Iran and Russia. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, that... They they may have the backing of Iran. I'm not sure how much they'll have the backing of Russia going forward. I I suppose it depends on the 
degree to which they find that uh, Turkey is an economic advantage to them. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if the Russians are letting the Turks go in, they're already planning on a post-Syria uh, without Assad. And they're probably getting assurances from Turkey that post-Assad Syria uh, will assure that Russia holds on to its naval base there. And that's all the Russians. You know, They just want to keep that influence in that region. And uh, maybe they'll look at the Turks as, as offering stability in the region. I don't know. That's wild speculation on my part. It is a possibility. It's hard to figure out what's going on in the Middle East because you think you got it figured out and then you wake up the next day and there's a move that's made that doesn't make any sense. It like contradicts the alliances that you thought were forming. It's spaghetti. It, it, it seemed like it was coalescing. Now it seems like we're getting more spaghetti noodliness going on. I don't know if you see it, but it's it's. Let, let's get to our last story. We're going to go to full auto, and this is, well, we're going to talk about the League of Women Voters supports anti-gun bills, and uh, NBC reporter shills for them. Have you heard about this? No, and honestly, do I care? I don't know. I I kind of care. Well, I, I, I kind of care. I read this the is... headline and I I went through that briefly, and I was thinking to myself, who the bleep and bleep cares what you think? I I just don't care anymore. Dude. I care. I care to cover these stories. This is the awareness part of iState.tv. Yeah, this is the. I get it. Hey, this this is your world. This is this is where you live in. These are how these people think. And by the way, you need to come to terms with the sheer vulgarity of their mindset and don't let them get away with talking in a civil tone about fundamentally vulgar things, about about ripping the self-defense tools out of people's arms. That's there's nothing civil about that. That's, yeah, but that's not the, a debate. It's very simple. They're not going to rip the tools of self-defense from my arms or the arms of tens of millions of other Americans. They can try, but hey, League of Women Voters, if you come for my guns, I'm going to shoot you. That's all there is to it. I'm, I'm not interested in compromising. I'm not interested in, in debating. I'm not interested in... Uh, uh, Considering their point of view, uh, it, it's not, it's a non subject for me. Just shut the hell up and get the hell out of the way. You should. Well, I tell you what, you can just take a break from this segment if this is not a story that in, in, interests you. I'm going to go ahead and share the story anyway because I think it's interesting and I think it's worth sharing. So, if you know anything about the League of Women Voters, they are ostensibly a nonpartisan group intended to help women get active in the political process, nonpartisan being the key. The League of Women Voters, these, th this is an organization that has been in charge of figuring out what presidential debates are going to be. They're a very powerful organization that got there by ostensibly being, uh, ostensibly, uh, can I say ostensibly again? Uh, politically unbiased, biased, but they've decided that you know what? It's just, it's just time to just come out and uh, just, just go for it. So the and show your true vote, colors. Show your true colors, right? Yeah, we know who they are. So the a, League of Women Voters in Charlottesville uh, are urging a newly elected uh, gun grabbing governor of Virginia to enact greater gun control laws they're openly calling now i i understand that they're not really going to be trying to rip the guns out of your arms but metaphorically and in their mindset that's what they want if for instance 
Today, they were given... I'll give you an example. Okay. If I was given the power to murder you where you stand, and I knew that I could get away with it, and no one would ever know it was me, I would not murder you where you stand. I couldn't do it. It's totally fundamentally against my very human nature. If they had the power to murder you, they would do so. <laughs> and by that I mean, if they had the power, if they knew that they could go across the country and take all of the guns out of all of the non-gov hands, they would do it in a heartbeat. So even if they don't really have the power to do it, to me, they've already committed the act by, by their very mindset, by what it is that they promote on a daily basis and how they do it in a way that they try to sound civil, that they try to sound like they belong to be in, in proper company, I'll say, proper being a subjective term, talking to people about these ideas. It would it wouldn't be tolerated by me if somebody sat down and said, you know, I think maybe we should, uh, you know, four-year-olds that just aren't cutting it, I think we ought to should just throw them into a fire. You know, that's not a debate I'm going to have with that person. I'm going to immediately assess that they are a fundamental threat to the community and work to isolate them as much as I possibly can. That's how I view these people. So I think of it differently. I think if someone has ideas as loony as throwing four-year-olds in fires, line them up and drop a a uh, 300 win mag through all of their brains simultaneously. I'm not I was interested being, in debating that. I was being euphemistic when I yeah, said I know. isolate them from the community. <laughs> I'm not interested in chit chatting with. Um, there's no other way of saying this, and I'm going to sound like a church lady with Satan worshipers because that's what these people are. They're just sick and evil. And I would say that about anybody who wants to disarm a person from being able to protect himself. Sick yeah, to me, this is how evil. I view them. They're fundamentally so, evil, sick people. Correct. I, I so don't have you, any patience for them. If you show up at my doorstep or the doorstep of my neighbor and say, we're here to take your guns, I see you as working for the dark side. Yeah, you're, you're working. You are. You're work. Why now on the, earth would I come out and try to debate you? There's no point. You're coming to me next. I'm going to come out guns a blazing because I know the where, point what's, of, what's in it for me. Now, the point of my story is, is twofold. One is to actually share the news that, yes, the League of Women Voters, uh, among the iState readers who may still be voters and may still think participating in the political process is a decent thing. Yeah, I want to kind of bring it to your attention. This is this is this is an organization that has a key position of power within that whole process of elections. And this is who they are. That's your reality. So that's one point. But the other point is to point out to help help people in my small way be a lot more critical when they're reading the news and and and, and understanding that very few straight news articles are actually straight news articles. In this, in this case, this Emmy Friedman from MS, NBC 29, she decided to, I mean, she used this title, League of Women Voters Calls for Tighter Gun Control. And, and she said in the first sentence, you tell me if you can identify what she's doing. Let's just do that, Mr. Professor Rambo. And this kind of ties into the the whole don't let yourself be conditioned to become a media zombie. Despite the General Assembly killing off a large portion of Governor Ralph Northam's gun violence prevention agenda, Charlottesville League of Women Voters is calling for tighter gun control. Can you see what she did in that one sentence alone that 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 lets you know that she's an operative and not a straight news reporter? Dis disguising well, a, herself as a straight well, news it's, reporter? It's all in the 
in the beginning of what she said. Uh, she's, she structures what she said as if she's on the moral high ground and gun control is the moral high ground and anyone who opposes it is some kind of degenerate. But, dude, I suspect that these women were had these inclinations and these political views long before they were exposed. This is oh, nothing absolutely. new. Totally this absolutely. Is who they've, yeah. This is who they've always been. And, and so much of the political arena in the United States has been compromised by European socialism and the socialist mentality. This goes back before Kennedy. This is nothing new. I, I am not surprised at all that these women have taken this position. It's, it's disappointing that... Uh, well, it's just horribly disappointing. But uh, look, the bottom line is the only thing that guarantees your gun rights are your guns. And they guarantee all your other rights, too. Yeah, there is no rule of law. There's only rule of power. Now, don't get me wrong. Rule of law is an aspect of power. It's ideational power. But where the rubber meets the road, where push comes to shove... It's it's certainly it's just a one element of power. It is not the power. So what I'll point out with that sentence <laughs> is it starts off saying killing off a large portion. Killing off. What are you doing? If 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 I'm writing that, I'm saying the general assembly successfully defended the Virginia people from the attack on their gun rights by Governor Ralph Northam. Yeah. Except if I write that, I am not going to write it in the in the framework of of a straight news piece. That's an editorial statement. And I'll make that editorial statement in editorials every time. I'm not going to write a sentence like that in a straight news piece. And then the second part of this, what does she call Northam's plans? His these bills that he tried to get through for the Virginia Assembly. Gun violence prevention. Why do you call it gun viol? It's okay. So, like you said, she set it up. You're immoral. It's like this isn't even like a decent conversation to have. The idea that people should be able to own guns and not be restricted by a monopoly of force around them. You are immoral. You are killing. And, and you are supporting gun violence by promoting uh, gun rights. That's what she's done there. And this is, I, I, I laid the challenge for folks uh, that, that might read the article. If you click through and read her old, whole article, this is a good exercise piece. For those of you who are already well aware of how this works, you don't need to do this. For, for those of you that maybe you're still reading things at face value, I would ask you to go through that article and choose and, 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 and look at the words that she uses to describe what I call the anti-human, anti-liberty actions. See, see how she describes that. And then look at how she chooses uh, to describe uh, folks that are standing up for gun liberty. And, and what you'll see is the... The positive words are used for the gun grabbers. The negative words are used for the gun supporters. And this is a tactic that you will see used. This is one of the most, maybe the most common tactic that media uses in its alleged straight news to nudge its readers towards an aggregate belief system that they want them to have. It's a very subtle and, and devilish thing. It's fine if you're doing it in an editorial. It's, it's, it's wicked propaganda if you're doing it in a piece in which you are alleging to be just writing a straight news piece. You got anything well, else? Because I think this show's done. Yeah, I do. If I came and tried to punch you in the face, do you have the right to punch back? Um, I don't believe in rights per se, but I would say that a the community natural. generally have, would support me in punching you back. It would be reasonable natural? to assume. Okay. So, and if I came to at you with a knife, would it be reasonable for you to defend yourself with a knife? Mm-hmm. 
How about a stick against a stick? Mm-hmm. Okay. So why not a gun against a gun? <laughs> YouTube. Um, I think it's Larkin Rose. When do you kill a cop? I'm not saying I'm not advocating for oh. killing cops at all, at all. I, I, but the video is not quite what what it sounds like. But but YouTube that, and that essentially, it pursues that question: when, when do you use a gun to defend against a gun, even if that gun is the gun of authority? Well, I'm not even talking about authority. I'm talking about crazy. Oh, I Dimitri thought that's what you were talking you. about. No, crazy Dimitri coming at you with a gun. You have the God-given right to defend yourself. Right. So whether it's crazy Dimitri or a crazy cop or a crazy country, why would people start to get in the mindset that they they shouldn't have the right to defend themselves? Unless they're zombies of the state who have come Media to believe. zombies. Correct. Who, who have come to believe that it's okay to be abused by the state as long as the children are safe. Well. Meanwhile, the children aren't safe. That's no, an meanwhile, illusion. The cha- yeah, the children are at peril even more by the state that will exploit them if the state is the only one with weapons. It, it, it's happened every single time that it, someone gets into power who believes that they are untouchable. They go after people and their property so that they can enrich themselves. Yeah, if, if they perceive that the people are unarmed. Yes. Correct. You, you, so, you think that Barack Obama would have done a lot more if this country had no guns? I guarantee you he would have. Oh, it would. And, and Trump, even Trump. Do you think that Trump would do more things in certain areas, maybe? And Bush. Possibly? And, and Bush, Bush and Reagan and, and, and Carter, Carter and, and Ford and go all the way back. You go all the way, yeah. The, look, I was in Greece recently, and something occurred to me while I was there. And, and it's occurred to me many times, but it was just being there really, really solidified things. The Greek government is not afraid of the Greek people. The Greek people are afraid of the Greek government. In the United States, there's still some in the government that fear the people. And there's still some people who don't fear the government. There's far more of that here than there. And the only reason why in the United States and in other truly free countries, the government fears the people a little bit is because the people can do so, stuff to the government. They can fight back and they can yeah. make the government's life a living hell. Yeah, and the government the isn't the afraid government, of, of, they're not afraid of the courts. They're not afraid that you'll fight for your rights in the courts. They're willing to, I, to give you that little illusion there to kind of keep you at bay somewhat. They're afraid that you'll actually take real physical power and use it against them. And hang them from the nearest tree. Right. Yeah, because that guy making the decision that's coming down the line, uh, his boss is saying, hey, you need to go after these people. Well, there's the real and present danger that these people might come after him. So right. there's a balance of power within the civil within a civil society when the people can defend themselves. There is no balance of power in countries like Greece where the Greek government keeps the people under its thumb. And it's yeah. not just Greece. It, it, yep. It's horrible. I mean, Greece is a bad example to use because it's actually a civil country. There are other examples uh, that are far worse. I mean, way worse. Totalitarian regimes. I mean, Russia's a prime example. Uh, Big surprise. If you lower the cost of coercion, you get more coercion. What a surprise. It's, it's simple yeah. math. It's supply and demand, dude. So, so I think on that note we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end this bye show. Bye. What's that? We're gonna say bye bye. We're gonna say bye byes. Uh bye bye. I'll be I'll be back tomorrow on my Facebook bye bye. page, Paul Gordon. 
with uh, headlines you may have missed. Hi, Hopefully hi. I'll have this technical issue. That's not annoying. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow night with Is Daily Tuesday with Bodhi Agora. And we'll be Yay, doing... Yay, Bodhi! Yay, Bodhi! We'll be doing Lolzilla. Lolzilla will be on tomorrow. Uh, and you and I will be back uh, borrowing some unforeseen disaster or or something really great who knows that we're preparing uh, for right uh that we are preparing for yes uh we'll be back next monday for another edition of is daily monday so i'll leave you i'm using this this is this is my little sign off that i'm using now and i use this on is daily monday i mean on uh headlines you may have missed and i'm also using it here and and that is uh where is it here dude dude where's my call i don't have it memorized yet i have it written down but uh hopefully i'll i'll uh i'll get it memorized remember that those who need to control thoughts need to control that news need need to control news so bear that in mind when you're reading news remember there's there's an agenda behind it so and I would see say, if you can figure out what it is. Stokalona Pass. Stokalona Pass, which means go. Go with the good. Go with the good. Go with the good. Oh, and by the way, Fly Eagles Fly, going to the Super Bowl. That's right. Got that in at the end. Good night, everybody.